Hi, everyone out there. Thank you for tuning in to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I am so excited. I have a legend on Love at First Laugh. Uh, this man is incredible. Uh, he uh, won three Emmy Awards and one Writer's Guild Award during the five years working on The Carol Burnett Show. Uh, hello. That alone is insane. Uh, then he also wrote for laugh -In, Mama's Family, Three's Company, The Tim Conway Show. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. He wrote for comedians like uh, Phyllis Diller, Bob Hope. He wrote books and books, and we're going to talk about comedy and all his experiences on these shows. Please welcome the legendary, amazing, and hilarious Gene Parrott. Hi, Gene. How are Hi, you? Hi, how are you? I, I never knew I was that good. <laughs> you are amazing. That's, I'm telling you, you're incredible. You're very humble. Did I do well with your last name, Thank Gene? Thank you for the intro. Go ahead. Sorry. Did I do well with your last name? Yes. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome, because I was very concerned. I'm from Argentina, so you know, I just I have Spanish ears. So, oh, is that right? Yeah. You know, most of the time, uh, people get it wrong when you tell them. Anyway. Okay. But I never pay attention to the last name unless they really get it wrong. But <laughs> yeah. We answer the parrot. We answer the parade. We answer the parrot. So it didn't matter to me. I hardly hear it. <laughs> here. Um, I just check, it, check that it's spelled right on the paycheck. That's all. Uh, there you go. That's exactly. You're you're a very smart man. <laughs> that's it. That's all that matters, really. They can murder your name. Who cares? Right, right. Yeah, I feel the same way. My name is Graciela, and I had to change it to Grace because uh, they murdered my Gracia Frela, Graciela, Graciol, <laughs> you know, Graciola. I mean, it was ridiculous. So I totally feel the pain. And my last name is also weird. So, but I want to just start saying uh, your book was one of actually the first books that I read when I started doing comedy. And you have some incredible stories and incredible um, tips on comedy writing. So I want to get into that first, if you are cool with that. That's fine. Awesome. You may have to remind me of some of the answers, but yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's uh, I'll I'll do that. No worries. Uh, what I love about the book is first you start saying that comedy is fun, right? If you it's it says I've written some good jokes in some bad places and some bad jokes in some good places, but I've been delighted with every minute of it. the The one overriding message of this volume is that comedy writing is fun. It's a capitalized fun, an underlined fun. It's fun in italics and fun in foreign languages. So what got you to start writing comedy? Was it just the fun of it or? Just for, for that reason, I enjoyed it. Yes. I, uh, I just thought it was fun. So I started doing it, you know, at, at work where I work back in Philadelphia. I do it over lunch and I got kind of a reputation and then my super, my first supervisor retired, and they asked me to do a little, a little sketch. And we did, and it went over well. And they said, "Would you do a party for the next guy?" And I wrote a monologue, and I became like the Toastmaster General of Philadelphia, <laughs> of the Switchgear Plant in Philadelphia. And uh, I just kept doing it and doing it, and got a reputation. And a friend of mine that worked with me, he was a part-time newspaper man. So he interviewed Phyllis Stiller. And I had been writing for other people before then, Slappy White and some others. But he interviewed Phyllis Stiller and said, we got a guy at work that writes jokes, would you? She said, tell him to send them to me. So I sent them to Phyllis, she bought half of them. And that was the start of everything. Phyllis was a big part of my career. That's amazing. Wow. So I, you started just because it was fun and at work, and then it just one thing led to the other. Um, and you uh, ended up like writing for the Carol Burnett show and all these amazing shows 
Um, I would love to know what is it like to write on a show like the Carol Burnett show? Like what is the process in the writing room? Well, they're, they're all different. The Carol Burnett show was an exception. It was a good show to work on. We had exceptional talent. Um, Harvey Corman, Tim Conway. Um, now my mind is going to go, of course, Carol Burnett. Yes. What's the girl's name? Vicki Lawrence. Vicki Lawrence. So we had exceptional talent and also creative talent. They would help with the jokes. They would uh, chip in. So it was um, it was a wonderful show to work on. And uh, we worked. I worked on it seven years and couldn't ask for anything better. Was that so, like the, the most fun show you ever worked on? Was that like? Well, my my partner that I worked with on the show said, on most other shows. You know, you tell people you're a comedy writer. They say, what show did you work on? And you say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so. And they say, I hate that show. <laughs> Carol Burnett, you say, I worked on the Carol Burnett show. You were proud to do it. And no one ever said, I hate the Carol Burnett show, except a few people who were probably fired from it. <laughs> so it was, um, it was a good show to work on and, and well-respected. That was important, too. You had to work for people that that you liked. Mm. Same with comedians. You you got to get with comedians that. First of all, you have a feel for their their timing and their their delivery and all of that. But you have to like them in a sense too. I mean, you can argue with them and have some feuds with them. But you have to like them. So it's a big part of of comedy. Absolutely. So you think relationships and comedy and how uh, easy you get along with people is probably up there with talent, right? Or even more important than talent. What do you? What is your? I, I'm you not sure, but it's it's hard to just as an audience, it's hard to laugh at anybody you don't like. Yeah, I've heard people say, "Oh, I I, I don't think the um, uh, Jackie Gleason show is very funny." And I'd say, why? And they'd say, it's too loud. Mm -hmm. Well, loud doesn't destroy funny. There were some comedians that were loud that we, we enjoy. Yeah. Sam Kinison may be one. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then there are some that you say they're too loud. I just don't like them. So you don't laugh at them as much. So yes, it is a big, it, it's a part of comedy that you, that you like who you're laughing at. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's extremely important. Likeability is import, very, very important. Um, so I, I love how you talk about on your book, like the, the ego, like how you got to deflate it a couple of times <laughs> that, you know, you would be uh, every conversation was sprinkled with my latest witticisms, you say, and then something would happen and, and your ego would be a little deflated. <laughs> Um, oh, it happens, happens just all the time. All the time. <laughs> oh, I no. worked with um, I worked with Bob Hope one time, and we were sitting there discussing a joke, and I ad libbed the joke, and he just stared at me for a long time, and he said, "That's not very funny." Now I have to defend my joke, so I said, "Well, I know, Bob, but it's it's." Uh, it's meaningful. It has people get it, uh, you know, inspired when they hear it. I said, I, I guarantee if you do that joke, you'll get applause. He said, how long have you been writing philosophy? <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> philosophy. Yeah. So yes, as a writer, you get put down and that's part of the job. You, that's, that is your job to, um, especially as a writer, to get most of your material turned down because that means they're looking for better material. So a good joke is a good joke, but most of them are looking for great jokes. Exactly. And that's what you want. So you want to get turned down. You want to keep going until you get the one that they can't 
possibly turn down. Now you've got a joke. I love it. So how, how do you, because you talk about this in your book, how do you get from being an okay writer, like, you know, and to get to be like an amazing writer? What does it take to become an ex excellent comedy writer? Well, I think it takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication and uh, quite a bit of research. For instance, in the book, I talk about um, if you want to write jokes, you've got to have something to build it on. So if you're going to write a joke about baseball, you want to start looking for good ideas about baseball and, and different ideas. Um, stealing second, hitting a home run, mm -hmm. ball bounces off the wall, uh, he's, the pitcher strikes out the batter, the batter um, gets a hit. Uh, whatever, whatever is in baseball, you want to use that as a joke. And uh, there are ways to do it. It's not my joke, but I love it. It, it just says that it uses a couple of ideas. And like a guy took um, some old ladies to the game and they each brought a fifth with them. I mean, they each brought something along with them. And the joke was, by the end of the fifth, the bags were loaded. <laughs> so you get, you grab something, and that's what you do. You got to look for things to grab, things that are in in part of the of the topic you're working on. Absolutely. And once you get to grab onto, now you can play with it and fool around with it and come up with a good idea and a good joke and that's that's really what it takes absolutely and i remember reading in your book that i think it was for phyllis diller you were writing um like let's say like 30 jokes or 60 jokes a, a day or something and she like she wanted more um is that am i am i quoting it correctly it was phyllis diller right i think it was pretty phyllis. much yeah i wrote the, i wrote for Phyllis, as yes. I say, my friend introduced us and she said, write some jokes. So I started writing for her and I would write as my goal. That's another part of being a good comedy writer, setting goals. I would set a goal of 30 jokes a week and I could meet it. Nice. And some were good, some were bad, some were awful. In fact, Phyllis would, would mark up the jokes that I wrote and I actually have copies of the pa of the pages she sent back to me, and it's written there, just in capital letters, awful. Oh my God! So she had no shame about telling me that this joke was awful, and I had no shame in in believing her. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, oh yeah. Like, you know, I wrote 30 jokes for her, and then I, this was over the phone and through the mails and all. And I went to see her at a big club in New Jersey, the Latin Casino, it was called. And it was a big place and very successful. And we went there and she packed the place. And we went backstage to meet her. And the first thing she said to me, she said, you're my best writer. And instead of saying, I was pleased, yeah, instead of saying, oh, thank you so much, I said, how come I'm not in Hollywood? Oh, <laughs> nice. She said, you're not ready yet, which is important. But she, she said, write more for me. So I went from writing 30 jokes to 60 jokes a week and eventually wow. 90 jokes a week. And I thought the top of my head was going to blow off. In fact, it did, you know, parts of it. Um, but I thought the top of my head was going to blow off. I was, I was struggling so hard to get jokes. And then it started to come easier. And 30 or 90 jokes a week didn't seem like that much of a chore anymore. I could turn them out. And the same thing when I worked with Bob Hope, there were days when he'd call with topics and we'd have to write two, 300 jokes a day. And we did it. 
Now, how many were used? I don't know. You know, they, they weren't all used because, again, he was turning them down because he wanted the best one. But, but it was interesting to me that uh, doing 90 jokes a week was at one time at Shore, and then after a while it became common, not commonplace, but fairly commonplace. It's like an athlete. The more you practice, the easier it becomes, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. That uh, the more you use that muscle, and some people have called it a muscle with me, mm -hmm. the more you use that muscle, the, the stronger it gets. And uh, if you want to be a good comedy writer, the first thing I say for someone that wants to be a comedy writer is to write. It doesn't cost anything except maybe some a ballpoint pen every now and then, every three or four years. <laughs> um, so it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. And you can just sit there and write and write. And then eventually, as you write, you'll get better and better. Mm -hmm. with, with, some, with some studying, some research, some learning, some training. So it takes all of that to go into um, becoming a solid writer. Yes, uh, and I remember reading in your book that you talk about uh, intellectual and practical knowledge. Um, what is the difference between intellectual and practical knowledge in comedy? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. So That's one of the ones you're gonna have to give me a hint on. I got you, I got you. Uh, Go ahead. So you say, with comedy, you can learn what to do by studying, observing, and analyzing. So that would be the intellectual. Uh, watch good comedians work in clubs, watch well-written TV shows and films, read funny scripts and play. Then begin applying what you learn in the practical sense. Only you can teach yourself to write with your own writing, writing, and more writing. So to you also recommend to, to look at other comics, analyze, I find myself as a comedian, I'm always analyzing. If I watch a TV show, a comedy, I am always analyzing how it's written, uh, the arc, I mean, everything. Um, so did you, did you also apply this in your career where you watched other shows a lot and, and then incorporated a lot of, of that in, in your writing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to. You have to watch shows. You have to learn what's done. Mm -hmm. You have to know how you know how it's done, why it's done, and different things like that. If you go to see a comedian, you've got to hear his timing, his delivery, mm -hmm. everything that goes into that act is part of the comedy world. So you've got to you've got to learn that. You've got to study it. And uh, the more you do, the better you get at it. But it's not always easy. Sometimes we, I'm making this up now, I don't know if it's in the book or not, but sometimes we um, make things up because they fit our style. Mm. To give you an example, I, I wrote for Bob Hope. That, that's my... Medal of Honor. I wrote for Bob Hope and I wrote for Phyllis Stiller. Same style. And then I had a I had a job where I had to write for Bill Cosby. Well, I didn't know Bill Cosby's style, and I wasn't that that uh, fond of it really. At well, I, I I always thought he was funny. Yeah. Not for me. Not for me as a writer. I couldn't write Bill Cosby style. And then I met with him a few times. Well, I worked with him every week, so I had to write something. So I'd sit with Bill and he'd come up with ideas and I'd come up with ideas. And next thing you know, you're writing Bill Cosby style. And that's what you have to do too as a, as a writer is you have to find 
that style and deliver it. It's like a musician. They play music, but they play it, some play it in different ways. Some play ragtime, some play jazz, some play slow. Uh, you've got to find that beat, the rhythm. And that's what you're looking for in comics. Uh, anything that will help you write a joke for that particular person. Absolutely. Um, so you're talking about voices, like comedians, different comedians' voices. And that uh, takes me to character, comedic character. Um, how do you create a comedic character when you're writing for a show? Well, you, you really, you, you don't create the character. Maybe you do. But what you've got to do is make sure that whatever you have this character say is something that character would say. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're looking to define the character with the jokes. Mm -hmm. For instance, as an example, you can't take a good joke that would be on, um, can't think of the name of the show, with Malone. Sam Malone as the bartender. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Yes. You can't take a joke that Sam Malone would say and give it to the guy sitting at the end of the bar. You can't take a joke with the guy sitting next to the next to the guy at the bar. And you got to, you got to make sure that whatever that character says comes from their ideas from their thoughts. Mm -hmm. It was interesting for me to watch the Mary Tyler Moore show. And they, they ran it in such a way that you could watch the first few shows. Well, you can watch the first few shows and they were not so good. Because, except for that first show with the when she was hired. It was a hilarious show. But the other shows, the characters didn't know who they were. Mm. The um, the guy, if I can't think of his name. Murray. Murray. The guy, the Murray that sat at the desk. He didn't quite know where he fit into this show. And even Mary was a little lost at times. But when you watch the show develop, they started feeling, oh yeah, here's the kind of jokes I'm doing. I'm getting jokes that now suit my character. Now I can deliver them with gusto. And the whole show started to brighten up, to pick up. Because you, you wrote jokes that fit the character. What you can't do, or what I don't recommend, is you can't write a joke and force it into a character. Yeah. You have to take the character as they exist, as he or she exists, and write for that character. And if you can do that, you're gonna have funny jokes and a, and a funny show, because the characters are real, they're live. Absolutely. Um, going back to comics, do you think, and the comedy writers, same thing, um, can you teach a person to be funny or do you think funny is an innate quality or is it half and half? Boy, I think you have to have um, a sense of humor. First of yeah. all, you, you have to like comedy. Uh, but then you, from there, I'm sure you can learn it. You can teach someone comedy. Uh, some it's easier than others. Yes, yeah. Some don't want to get it. They won't get it. But part of why they don't get it is because they're not working hard enough at getting it. In my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But I think you can teach, you can teach damn near anything. You can take kids that I went to school with who were imbeciles. <laughs> and now that you dress them as Dr. So-and-so. Well, they learned how to learn. And I think the same thing can be said of comedy, uh, humor. 
you can pick it up and learn it and um, and become funny in your own way. Not everybody agrees with your sense of humor, mm -hmm. but you've got one and you, you deliver it. Uh, so I think you can teach comedy and I think you can learn comedy. I love that. I read, I read a book once by a, a writer and television. I won't say, well, I have to say who it was. It was um, Neil Simon's brother. And he wrote a book and on the first page, he said exactly what you said. You can't, you can't teach comedy. Page one. Page four, he said, everything I learned about comedy, I learned from my brother. How can you learn if you can't teach it? If you can't <laughs> learn it, how, how do you do that? It, it's, yeah. it's a contradiction. So I don't, I don't believe the, the people, I see them and hear them a lot in, in the business, um, that you, you have to be born a writer. You can't become a writer. Yeah. And I don't believe that. And I don't think they believe it either. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. Absolutely. It's like being born a doctor. I mean, you have to study to be a doctor, right? It's true. That's true. Yeah. It is like that, yes. Yeah, I agree completely. I'm um, going to use that from now on. Don't go on it. <laughs> go ahead. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have my good friend Chris. He's saying TV was much better in the 70s and 80s. Do you agree with him? Oh, I agree with him totally. I, mm -hmm. I agree with him totally. I think um, TV, now if we're talking sitcoms, uh, I think it was better because it wasn't as um, such a single point of view. Everything now is I'm dating, um, going out with a girl and doing terrible things to her and that kind of stuff. And it all comes down to that. Mm -hmm. And you look back at, now that's that's one premise. Yeah. If you want to do a premise like that, do a premise like that. But take a look at the old um bah, 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 what show was I talking about? Was I gonna talk about? Oh uh, Dick Van Dyke show. Dick Van Dyke show had premises that were unbelievable. And they had nothing to do with with sex or four letter words or three letter words or whatever. They just were based on good ideas. Like for instance, well, the one show is where um, Mary discovered or admitted to the world that her boss, Carl Reiner was bald. And that became a whole big to do. Right. And it was all about exposing his baldness <laughs> there was another one and then there was a classic one of the funniest shows ever written another one where she there was a package that arrived for dick van dyke and she couldn't resist seeing what it was so she pulled the string and it was a giant inflatable raft now she's got a raft in the living room <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's gonna hide this she didn't open it it, it happened by accident and the classic was um, Chuckles the Clown, which was a clown that was in the parade, such and such a parade, I guess Thanksgiving Day, I don't know what. And it, it, Chuckles was a clown that, and he, he was dressed as a peanut and he marched behind the elephant. <laughs> and the elephant ate him and this was the funeral for him and Mary could not stop laughing laughing <laughs> it's an hilarious show but these are premises these are real good premises they're not the same thing over and over again it's the same thing today's shows are and I find that to be a fault when you get too, too singular in your approach, 
it's going to hurt because you're just doing one idea. Do several ideas, do clever ideas, do new ideas. So yes, I agree. Thank you. That was, that was brilliant. I love that. Uh, so here, uh, Chris has another question. How does Gene feel about reboots of classic TV shows? We were just talking about that tonight before we came on. <clears throat> um, most reboots I find are lacking. They don't have the gusto that the original show had. Just as an example, the show I worked on, the Carol Burnett show. If you tried to do that today, the performers would be different not different, but I mean different in their philosophy. Mm -hmm. They'd be different characters. Uh, actually, they'd be different people. Carol Burnett is different today than she was when I worked with her. Really? That's, that's very, well, I'm, I'm sure she is. I don't see her much anymore, but, but I'm sure she's different than she was when we did the show. Mm -hmm. So reboots are, to me, a gamble. Right. You, uh, you you can come back with them, and if it works, it works. But it's a, it's a real risk that you can come back with a show like I, I the show we were talking about was a remake of um, Mad About You. I oh. haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm I'm sure it's different in many ways. Well, first of all, they're older, but they're doing. If they do the shows as them being older, mm -hmm. work. If they try and duplicate the old shows, it doesn't work. So it, it's hard to, to figure whether it's going to work or not. Yeah, yeah. If it does, you know, George Burns one time. Um, called his writers in because the show was failing. Now this is way back. This is maybe even radio and then television. And he called the writers in and he said, guys, Gracie is not a young woman anymore and I'm not a young man. We need jokes that apply to George and Gracie as they are now. Uh, what kind of premises or jokes can we do about that situation? And they changed the philosophy of the sitcom mm -hmm. and it worked. It became a, a good show again for a long time until we lost jo George. Uh, it was pretty much on the air all the way. But it, it took him to figure out that we're talking about different people here, not we're not talking about young George and young Gracie. We're talking about George today and Gracie today. Yeah, like the matter about you, it's later in life. So it's going to be a whole different vibe than when they were younger. So it should be. Yeah, it should be. If it's going to work, if they do it as young people and maybe even if they bring in new performers, I don't, I don't think they did. But if they do it about young people, it's going to be um, difficult to make it work. But as I understand, they're doing about uh, about these people as they grew older. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not a bad premise either, the fact that they've grown older. There are many, believe me, I know there are many premises in growing older. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've lived most of them. Uh, so there, there is something to do. There, there are good re reboots and bad reboots. There are good ideas for reboots and bad ideas for reboots. So you take a chance. You take yeah. a risk. Absolutely. Here's my friend Jimmy. Uh, without Gene's books, there would be no me. His comedy writing book was my first, and I consider it the Bible. Thank you, Gene. You gave me a 30-year career so far with your knowledge in your books. The rule of comedy in threes, tax, etc. Very nice. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. That's very nice to hear that. It's nice to hear someone say that. Um, that's why it was written. I wrote it. Uh, I told you how I got started earlier. 
And then I wrote the books because I was having so doggo much fun. And I started to travel a little bit. And I found out that uh, I was traveling around and you meet a lot of people that don't have an opportunity to learn about comedy, to join clubs or anything. Most comedy is in uh, New York, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, maybe Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to find people. And I thought, well, gee, I'll do a book and maybe get them interested in it. And I'm so delighted when people say that they enjoyed the book and that it helped them a lot. So thank you, Jimmy. Absolutely. And uh, this was one of the, actually probably the first book that I've ever bought. And I just read the whole thing and I reread it today. <laughs> you know, this really? weekend. I read, of course. How do you think I know all the stuff that's in it? <laughs> I don't know all the stuff that's in it. I, I wish I did. <laughs> uh, but really it's great. some of the stuff you're going to have to help me with, as I mentioned. <laughs> All good. I'm here for you. Uh, you know, what I really would love to know is um, like the Carol Burnett show, right? Like how was the writer's room? What was the creative process? Like you get to pitch your idea and and then it gets done. You write it. Do you write it with a partner by yourself? So how how is the process? Well, the main process was to go in the, in the room as a gang and come up with premises. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you an example. We all sat in a room, I say there are 10 or 12 of us, depending on which show we're working on. And um, one of the gentlemen said um, that we went to a restaurant last night and there was always two waitresses that came. Mm -hmm. And a waitress and another waitress who never said anything, just followed her. And we said, well, wh what, are, what are you doing? And she said, I'm a puppy. And what she meant was she followed the waitress around until she became good enough to be a waitress herself. Mm -hmm. But we said, that's not, that's not really a, a funny premise. But we took it because we thought it was funny enough. And somebody took it, I forget who. It might have been Rudy DeLuca and Barry Levinson who did it. Because it was Rudy, it was um, Barry Levinson who went out for dinner this night. And um, they said, well, we can, we can try it with something else. So we worked, worked, worked again. You want to get your ideas turned down so you can come up with the best one. Well, the best one we came up with was a bank robber. Now, Carol was at this, it was a teller, and Harvey Corman said, Give me all your money. You know, whatever it is they say. Yeah. And Carol said, Oh, gee, I'm glad you did this now because I'm working with a young girl who's my puppy. And she has to learn. So would you mind if she listened in while we did our transaction? <laughs> and Harvey said, you know something? It's some. It's funny that I have a puppy who's learning how to be a bank robber. Do you mind if we do this together? So we did the whole sketch about them being teaching puppies. And then finally a cop walks in. Stick them up. We got you. And he says, if you just hold on, on a minute, because I have a friend here who is going to be my puppy as a cop. And that was the, the whole story. But it was all based on the gang saying we went out to dinner and there were two waitresses all the time. But it built into it. It was a very successful sketch. We built it into that. So... Um, I forget now what the original question was. No, it's, it, no, you answered the question. <laughs> you completely answered it. So you bring an idea or something that happens to you. And I, I, I spoke to Steve Scroven, like uh, he was on my show like three times. He was on Everybody Loves Raymond. And they did the same thing. They brought stories from their married life 
to the show and then they used it, but they of course changed them, like you said, and made them funnier. So anything, anything in comedy, I think can be an inspiration to, and turn it into something funny. Um, yeah. yeah. How do you well, get- What, what we, do, we do after, when we decided that we talked it all out and got the best idea we could get. Yeah. We thought we could get. And then we turned it over to a team and the team perfected it. They wrote the sketch. Now, sometimes they would come back and we'd all sit together and rewrite it. There's an off, as you asked about earlier about failing and being humiliated many times. Yes, you do get jokes thrown out and you get them thrown out by your partner, first of all. Mm-hmm. And then by the team, after it's all done, somebody says, well, I think you can get a better joke in there. And we work until we get it. And finally, we wind up with, she's learning, she's teaching someone to be a teller. He's teaching someone to be a bank robber, which is a strange concept. Yeah. And then the cop is teaching someone to be a cop. So it, um, that's generally the way we work. Now, once in a while, we take a, <clears throat> an idea and give it to a special team that, that felt like they could handle it right off the bat. Most of the, um, most of the takeoffs on movies were done, and Carol did a lot of those, were done that way. My partner and I did um, National Velvet. We got the movie, we watched it one day, and then we did a script on it. One team always did uh, the Mama's Family as, they did it originally as a sketch, and then it became their their property almost. So that's the way we worked as uh, on the Burnett Show. That's, thank you, that was, that was very, um, that was great. I didn't know that you know, you gave it to a team and then they wrote it. I never, I never knew that. That's, that's great. Thank you. Um, here, Chris is saying, what was a typical, he's asking, what was a typical day for a writer hours? Well, um, Weiss working on a sitcom. Okay. We would get into work, um, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, I guess it was. Then we go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> After after we sobered up from lunch, <laughs> no, no, we we um, we would break it at a normal time for lunch, and we'd either schmooze or talk or sometimes uh, whatever. But that that was our normal day. Now then, the end of the day was around six o'clock. But see, there was a place, a little bar we went to across the street called the City Slicker. Mm -hmm. And I explained to my wife one time, I said, we leave at six o'clock. If I leave then and come home, it takes me like two hours till eight o'clock to fight the traffic. Mm -hmm. But if I just sit in the city slicker until about one o'clock in the morning, there's no traffic at all. And she didn't buy that story. So. <laughs> I'm not buying it either. <laughs> she didn't buy that at all. <laughs> no, we would we would work till well, it varied. We would work till six on most days. Mm-hmm. But there would be days like when we had we had a rehearsal on Wednesday, and then we'd have a writers meeting afterwards. Again, we'd hear this can be improved here, this can be improved here, this can be improved here, and we'd stay there and improve it. And that might might be twelve or one o'clock. Wow! That night might be long. Um, yeah. One guy, one of the writers on the Carol Burnett show said he loved the show because he would drive home and never have to put his lights on. But then when he, after he said that, the Joe Hamilton, the executive producer, found out a way to keep us there. So we had to put our lights on. 
Yeah. He kind of took a little bit of offense at that. It, it wasn't meant that way. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a very it's very intense, uh, very intense work schedule right there. Uh, so here we have Chris saying good stuff. Uh, Jamie, the godfather of comedy writing, one of my favorites. Thank you, Jamie. That's hmm. you're like the godfather of comedy. He's saying, and you're one of his favorites. Everybody's loving you. They all love you. Uh, we all if there's anybody that don't agree, I have them bumped off. That's why they call me the godfather of comedy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if I had this, I'd put it in my... Anyway. <laughs> oh, Nate is saying I'm loving these stories. Thank you, Nate. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm glad you are. Everybody's loving you. So tell us, I, I was just thinking like... Do you have, what is your favorite story from any of the shows you worked on? Oh boy, that's hard to say. Um, I would, I'm trying to think of most of the Bob Hope stories. The one I love most is the one where, when, when are you going to be a philosopher? What, when did you start writing philosophy? <laughs> yeah, ouch. But we went to, we traveled to um, Acapulco to do a show there and we took a day or half a day off and we went to the, the place where they do the diving, Acapulco Bay, I guess it is. Oh. And we watched and these guys climb up and halfway up they say a prayer. Yeah. And halfway up I would change my shorts, believe yeah. me. <laughs> Same here. Then you, climb, <laughs> then you climb the rest of the way up and then when the wave is just right, they dive, and it's beautiful. And Bob yeah. Hope was astounded. He said, boy, did you ever see anything like that? Phyllis Diller says, all my blind dates do that. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> so funny. <laughs> so that's one of my favorites. That is so cool. Uh, here we got more, more praise. You are the best, Gene. Miss seeing you, Marty. Hi, Marty. So oh, hi, Marty. How are you? How are you feeling? I hope good. Yeah, I love Marty. He's he's a good friend. And here, Dan is saying, you look great. I miss you, Gene. Oh, Dan, thank you for saying I look great. I mean, that's, that's really buttering me up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so how many how many books do you do you have um, available on Amazon? So whoever is watching that wants to read your books, want to be wants to become a comic or is a comic and wants to read your books, um, you have this one that I have, comedy writing step by step, right here. Um, then you have uh, the comedy writing workbook, right? That's an excellent book. That that's the reason it's excellent, and we have two of them. Uh, we did another one called Comedy Writing Workbook. Self-taught. Self-taught. Self-taught, because I do believe most comedy is self-taught. Mm -hmm. But these are good books because they get you, they give you assignments. They get you to work on a certain assignment. For instance, you know, Somebody falls down the stairs. What can you say about it? I mean, they're more defined than that. Yeah. But um, they're all based on different ideas that you have to turn in and work on. And the one has, um, it may have like 101 exercises. Wow. So it's a lot, there's a lot of work in there. But there's a lot of learning in there too, and as as I said before, if you want to learn, you got to do some work. As you pointed out, you don't get to be a doctor by <laughs> hanging around the cafeteria. It's right. not going to happen. Or googling web med. <laughs> right, right. So you have to you have to learn. You have to work at it, and that's what these books will do. The first one was everything I know about comedy and everything I think you should know about comedy. Mm -hmm. um, I say everything that's said with some kind of trepidation. Uh, but the exercises are wonderful. So if you can get one of the workbooks, uh, 
I think it'll be big benefit to you. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, and I know that uh, Linda is working on a documentary uh, called, um, uh, is it the Comedy Writing Guru? So there she is. Where are you, Linda? <laughs> and I'm here. I'm over here. I'm going to bell out because I don't, I don't get involved in the documentary. You that, are that's not. A, that's a little too much ego for me, but... <laughs> She's yeah. working on it hard. So I'll let her, I'll, we'll switch seats. No, stay, no, stay, stay, stay. And, and like, so you I, can, can, I can just come in. There you go. Perfect. She's trying, trying, to shove, <laughs> trying to shove me out of the picture. <laughs> I work all my life and she just gives me an elbow and I'm gone. <laughs> That's too funny. So let me, uh, let me see. Here is this. Let me see if I do it right. Am I doing it? No, I'm doing it terribly because I'm sharing. Okay, let me let me try again. Um, this is a one woman production, so <laughs> they would be you're doing great. Your great. logo yeah. is great, by the way. The love at first laugh is great logo. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I uh, I got it redone. I rebranded everything. So the part I you know I'm trying to. Why is it? Oh, application window. Okay, I was in the wrong place. Okay, <laughs> so now we're talking. Yay. Uh, so here it is. So tell us a little bit about uh, the documentary, Linda. So this goes back to what Jimmy was saying earlier. And what we did, what I wanted to do was there, working with Wendy Liebman, um, co-producing with Dan, um, the locally grown comedy show. So many of the comics would come in and when they found out who dad was, they would go, I owe my career to him. Oh. Everything I've done, you know, he, he he got me started. He gave me the encouragement. And I wanted to make sure that those philosophies carried on. So we're doing this documentary. It, it tells dad's story. But more importantly, it tells about the teaching of comedy and the encouragement to carry it forward. Because I want these lessons to continue on and to people to benefit from the luxury I've had growing up around it and that other people have experienced too. I love that. Uh, so how was it growing up in a comedy household? <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. I mean, I I never knew. <laughs> yeah, you can know that. that. <laughs> Right. We don't like each other very much. <laughs> <laughs> Which one should go? Like both of you, I would love to have both your faces on. Okay, so lean in this way, Dad. Oh. There we go. Yeah, there you are. Yes, <laughs> both of this. Dad and daughter. I love it. So, so growing up with comedy was, was terrific. And um, we have a very funny family. So we, <laughs> we were always laughing. Um, always having a good time. And then I followed in dad's footsteps and it was, it was terrific. I mean, I have no complaints. That, that is awesome. Is it when you grow up in, in a comedy environment, um, do you find that you have less of a filter when you're in social situations maybe, or <laughs> like you say things that people are like, wow, like normal people are not comedians. Yeah, I think sometimes you do you you say things, but you also know not to say things. You learn <laughs> what you can say and when you can say them and when you can't. There's a lot of things said at the dinner table, and my mom's favorite expression is, "This is why we're never going to be invited to the White House." <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, here's Nate. I love this. Thank you, Nate. There's no such thing for too much ego for such a talented writer and comedian. Oh, Nate, my mom would fight you. <laughs> You'd be surprised, Nate. <laughs> that's, that my, that's my hook now is that I, uh, I am a super ego. <laughs> Yeah, that's the part I play, and uh, they have to put up with it, but it's fun. It's all done for fun. I think you're a very humble man, and you're amazing, and you're so humble, and you give back to the community, and we love you and appreciate you so much. Well, I, I try and use the philosophy that Bob Hope used. He said, my wife keeps telling me to 
to show some humility, whatever that is. <laughs> but that's the way I am. I, I'll do it if I can find out what it is. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so here's Chris. Great show, Grace. Gene is a legend in this industry. You you have it like they love you, Gene. I can <laughs> so many like you. Uh, love comments. So, I must say, being in, I just claim to be an egotist and all that. I must say, I really appreciate the um, the thoughts that come from people. As Linda pointed out, when I meet someone like we're in the club and you meet someone and they say, oh, you're responsible for, I, I love those things because they mean it's working. So mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so here's Chris. I know this is a question for Linda, but Linda, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I love how you guys are sharing screen. Uh, when will the documentary come out? We are getting back to work. We had to stop because of COVID. So we are now getting back to work and um, hunkering down and getting it done. And I am hoping to have it done this year. So fingers yes. crossed. And yeah. So we're we're moving forward and this is going to come out. It's going to be great, even if I say so myself. <laughs> it's it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. Yeah. This is awesome. Uh, so here, Chris, <laughs> I was asking you, does Gene like Canadians? Because <laughs> he's Canadian. <laughs> As long as they stay put, you know. <laughs> oh, I love, love, I love all people that laugh, and we found out that there's laughter all over the world. We we travel around the world, and uh, we we actually did. We we took off heading west from from Los Angeles, and we spent three or four days, maybe five. And we came back flying west into Los Angeles. So we traveled the world and we hit a lot of places. And that's the one thing you find out is that if you can make people laugh, you've got friends. That is true. Hi, boss. I'm <laughs> taking your time. <laughs> no, this is a joint effort. So don't. <laughs> Yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, here Nate is saying, when that documentary comes out, I want to buy tickets to that premiere. Whoop. You got it, Nate. So Nate, go to the website, comedywritingguru.com. Mm -hmm. And we do have um, a newsletter. Or it says newsletter, but you can put your email address in there. and We'll keep you updated on what we're doing and what's going on. And we would love the support. Excellent. Mm -hmm. When you hear this stuff, Nate, Tell me, because I don't get anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So you were talking about traveling. Uh, what was your favorite country that you ever been to? The most fun I had <laughs> was in Germany. Really? In, Mo in Moscow. We stayed at... Um, the airport. We we went over the name of it last. Hitler's airport. You know, I can't think what it was called. Anyway, it was Hitler's airport, and it's almost as big as the Pentagon. And I had generals' quarters in there, and it was it was wonderful. But the guys in our group were fun. We were in Germany. They got all this lovely food. And we would go out every night for it. We met these this Italian people that ran a little little cafe, and we would go there every night for dinner, and we had a blast. So I would say Germany was the most fun I had. Oh, and then one story too to show you how things went. We went for a ride as we were getting ready to leave, but one of the military gentlemen took us for a ride and we went, I said, what's that up there? And he said, it's the church. So we drove halfway up the mountain. And uh, I said, what are the red tablecloths for? Red checkered tablecloths. He said, we serve drinks on uh, Sunday. People come here to drink. I said, good. 
and then the priest leaned out the window and hollered something in Italian. I couldn't tell what it was. So I asked the, the gentleman, and I said, what did he say? Well, where, are they going to open for us? He said, yeah, they'll open if you want them. I said, can we we'll see the church then? He said, no, no, he'll open the bar, but he won't open the church. Ah, <laughs> that's great. Because <laughs> he made money from the bar. Of course. That's funny. That is funny. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Gene. We've been like on for an hour. I could do another hour, three hours with you. This is so fun. You are so amazing and such a beautiful person and incredibly talented and generous. And I, I really appreciate that you um, agreed to be on my podcast. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I enjoyed seeing some of our old friends, Dan and Marty and some others. Yes. It was nice to uh, to visit with you and with them. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And we're going to close on this great show. Thank you, Jean and Linda. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Thank you, Chris. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for tuning in and all your wonderful comments and questions. And I will see you guys next Sunday at 7 p.m. the usual time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gene and Linda, and um, we'll end the broadcast. <laughs>